für die größte Liebe kommt der alte letzte Kuss, schwor man oft auch für ewig, einmal ist ja doch Schluss. Ursula Bormann was the second daughter of Heinrich Wilhelm and Martha Amanda Bormann, who had lived in Harburg for several years. Her father worked for the Harburg Iron and Bronze Works in Severstrasse. The authorities kept a dossier and classified him as an occasional drinker and antisocial. Ursula's mother, on the other hand, was considered a decent, righteous woman. She came from East Prussia and was the youngest of six children. After leaving school, she initially worked as a maid in a household, but by the age of 23, she had been plagued by frequent epileptic fits, which had apparently been rectified after appropriate medical treatment. Ursula also suffered from epileptic seizures. By the age of two, she could walk but not speak. Most of all, however, she was a very restless child who required a lot of attention. This prompted her parents to seek help from the welfare office. A carer from Harburg, who subsequently visited the family, noted, Because of her incessant restlessness of movement, Ursula is a great burden for the relatives, which the parents cannot cope with in the long run. The parents have asked for a medical examination and possible accommodation in Altersdorf, which was a psychiatric institution. The Harburg Youth Welfare Office responded promptly. Three days later, the senior physician in charge of psychiatry and neurology stated in his diagnosis that Ursula Bowman is a child with a slight mongoloid stigmatization and extreme restlessness of movement. Admission to a nursing home, Altersdorf, is therefore absolutely necessary as soon as possible. On November the 16th, 1939, Ursula was transferred to the institution in Altersdorf, which Pastor Heinrich Matthias Sengelmann had founded in the 19th century for physically and mentally handicapped people. In order to bring Christ to the poor and for the poor, the least of brothers, and to see and love them for his sake and after his example. In the 1930s, the Institute increasingly lost sight of its noble goals. In place of the individual educational support for disabled people, came the belief in the alleged benefits of a pseudo-scientific hereditary biology and a rigorous racial hygiene for the benefit of a healthy national body. Gerhard Krehenberg, the senior physician in charge of the hospitals at the time, was also influenced by this therapeutic spirit of optimism. For him, imbecility was a disease that, after thorough medical diagnosis, could be treated by medical means. He wanted not only to help the individual, but to heal the whole national body. When this did not lead to the desired result, he saw a way out in the selection, actually elimination of the incurables. During the initial examination, the Altersdorf doctors at the time diagnosed Ursula Bormann with imbecility and epilepsy. She had to be fed by hand and lay manacled to her bed all day, about which her mother complained to the State Youth Welfare Office and applied for her release. This was successful and the child was released to her mother's care. However, when the responsible medical officer found a deterioration in her state of health during a psychiatric follow-up examination, the six-year-old child was again admitted for immediate custody in the summer of 1942. In July 1943, Pastor Friedrich Lynch, the then head of the Altersdorfer Institute, used the heavy bombing raids on Hamburg as an opportunity to have 469 patients transported from his house to other facilities. 
after some of the other houses in the grounds of the institute had suffered minor bomb damage, he asked the Hamburg health authorities to relocate 750 residents. Because most of the vacant rooms were still very much habitable, the idea was to use them as emergency accommodation for German civilians whose homes had been destroyed. The Hamburg Senator for Health complied with the request and ordered the further measures to implement the promised aid. Ursula Bormann was among the 76 men, women and children who were deported on August 7, 1943 to the Eichberg Sanatorium in the Rheingau. A note, a simple explanation was entered on her medical record. Relocated because the Altersdorf institutions have been destroyed. The state care and nursing institution Eichberg in Hesse was one of those institutions that were closely interwoven with the euthanasia program of the National Socialists. The head doctor of the facility, Friedrich Manecker, was an expert at the T4 headquarters in Berlin and head of various medical commissions and was one of the staunch supporters and executors of this murder program. In the first phase of the murders, the Landesheil and Pflegeanstalt Eichberg served as one of the numerous stations at which the selected persons were collected before they made their way to the gas chambers of the nearby Hadamar Extermination Center. After the official end of this phase of the National Socialist Euthanasia program, murders continued in Eichberg. Here the patients were largely left to their own devices. In addition, they were very poorly fed. Often it was decided to end the life of a sick patient by lethal injection. This method was developed in the children's department of the Heil und Pflegeanstalt Eichberg, established between 1940 and 1941, and was later introduced in other departments of this facility. The Ulsterdorf patients arrived in Hattenheim on August 8, 1943, crammed into a freight wagon where they were loaded like cattle on trucks and taken to the Eichberg Sanatorium. Of the 28 children on this transport, 20 were immediately transferred to the children's department. The remaining eight followed a few days later after a detour via the Department for Female Observation. When Ursula Bollmann was put to death on September 23, 1943, she was not even eight years old. I'll never forget how scared Mother was about everything in the English park, especially the roller coaster. But she had as much fun at the zoo as I did. We also went to the children's theater. Then we took an afternoon break. Chocolate with whipped cream and strawberries with cream. Eva's childhood ended abruptly when the Germans invaded Hungary in 1944 and occupied her hometown of Nagivarad. She was 13 years old at the time. Dear Diary, you are the happiest in the world because you cannot feel, you cannot know what terrible thing happened to us. The Germans have come. Of course, the 13-year-old could not have known at that stage what exactly it would mean for her to have to live as a Jewish girl under the occupation of Nazi Germany. She confides her premonitions in her diary, but does not give up her sense of humor. But Kahn won't return here until Hitler is dead, and I saw in the newsreel and in the films that he looks very healthy. This man won't die anytime soon. Every day they bring out new laws against Jews. Today, for example, they took away all of our equipment. The sewing machine, the radio, the telephone, the vacuum cleaner, the electric deep fryer, my camera and my bicycle. 
Mother said we should be happy that they take things and not people. Eva hadn't had her bike very long. The family had saved up for a long time and Eva's old bike and her grandfather's winter coat had to be sold in order to finally raise the necessary sum. Eva didn't pick up her brand new bike until the full price had been paid off in cash. After that, she brought the bike home, but she still didn't ride it. She pushed it, or, in her own description, walked it, like walking a big, beautiful dog. The bike also got a name, Friday. Eva had read the book Robinson Crusoe and wanted to express with the name that her bicycle Friday would always serve its owner, Eva Robinson, faithfully. It was also on a Friday that Eva brought the bike home. Well, dear diary, I threw myself on the floor clutching the rear wheel of my bike and yelling all sorts of things to the police. You should all be ashamed of taking a girl's bike away. This is robbery. It got worse. In 1939, shortly after the German army invaded Poland, the Germans ordered Jews to identify themselves with a yellow star. This law was gradually passed in all Nazi-occupied countries. The law initially applied to adults and children over the age of 10. How did children and young people feel when they took to the streets for the first time, with the stars sewn onto their clothes? Eva Heyman describes the general mood. Dear Diary, an order was issued today that from now on, Jews must wear a yellow patch in the shape of a Star of David. The order specifies exactly how large. The star patch has to be sewn onto every outer piece of clothing, every jacket, every coat. I've already met a few people with yellow stars. They were so depressed. They walked with heads bowed. Eva was still only 13 years old, when she and her grandparents perished in the gas chambers at Auschwitz in October 1944. Her mother, Agnes Aggie Zolt, had been a pharmacist. Eva had described her as more beautiful than Greta Garbo. Aggie and her husband were living in Paris when the Germans invaded Poland. Terrified for her daughter, she convinced her husband to return to Budapest. She herself was held at the Bergen-Belsen concentration camp, but made it to safety in Switzerland after she was rescued from the camp. She committed suicide after her daughter's diary was published in 1964. One and a half million children were murdered in the Holocaust. They were either shot gassed, hanged, or tortured to death. The philosophy of the regime allowed them to be murdered. This included letting them die of thirst or freeze to death. They received no medical attention, nor any mercy. The vast majority of these children have been forgotten. In many cases, their names have disappeared, as if they had never existed. One and a half million dead children because of the evil directives of a few. Let humanity never ever stand idly by again. The annihilation of one and a half million young lives. The annihilation of their hopes and wishes, dreams and expectations. It's the hardest lesson we've ever had to learn. History must never be repeated. If a future government ever tries to convince us to participate in something we know in our hearts to be wrong, to be evil. We must take a stand against them.
Well, my dear friends, two heartbreaking accounts, I think you'll agree. The first girl being taken away from her parents and not comprehending why. Just being terribly sad, frightened, I could imagine, and having no idea why this was being done. And how did the nurses feel about putting such children to death? Did they do so with easy hearts? That's the question. And the second girl, Eva, knowing the reality, the outcome of the German invasion of her country, and being terrified of it, but still not knowing really why. Why would they do that to children? Even we can't comprehend that. How could she? It's absolutely insane. And again, as I said in the Francesca Mann video, it wasn't that long ago. That's even more terrifying. It was not that long ago. When I look at those images of the children looking through the fences of the concentration camps, I see in their eyes pain, probably from hunger and cold, fear, being separated from their parents in many cases, and incomprehension. Why? They were living normal lives, you know, buying toys from shops, and suddenly they're locked away in rags, being starved. No, it's not right, and it, it shouldn't have happened in the 20th century. It shouldn't have happened. Yes, what, what makes me wary of governments? That's the question. What makes me wary of governments? And I'll tell you what makes me wary of governments is that most individuals who are attracted to a position of power are not kind and compassionate people. Kind and compassionate people don't want to rule over others. It's just the way it is. And most of these leaders are ruthless. They have gotten there through pushing other people out the way. Would they resort to character assassination of their opponents? Without a doubt. Would they resort to lies and blackmail? Yes, most certainly. And I'm not talking about just countries with dictators. I'm talking about Western democracies as well. Oh, yes. And in the rare circumstances where there is actually a politician who is there for the people, you can guarantee he's not going to get in. And if he does get into power, he's not going to be there for long. We've seen that happen time and time again, haven't we? Would some of these ruthless power brokers resort to actual assassination? Unfortunately, yes, is the answer. A desire for power and money is what rules the world. That's it. And we are just pawns in the game. That's all we are. And unfortunately, and it is quite sad, most people go along with the mainstream narrative. They really are like sheep and they trust their government. Totally. That saddens me. They never really question it. Maybe it's a fear. They don't really want to know what's going on around them. When the internet first came into being, I thought to myself, here's an opportunity for people all around the world to be able to communicate with each other, finally. And for the wonderful online translation software that we could actually communicate, understand each other, and then a lot of barriers would be broken down. These barriers caused by political and religious brainwashing. That's what I thought. But then, of course, the powers that be became aware of this and didn't like it. They could smell revolt uprising, and so they started censoring. As we can see today, a lot of stuff is being censored. Opposing countries will be pushing their own narratives and agendas and of course blocking the other country's version. And of course there's always the constant distraction, which they do love. They, you know, they keep us in fear, they keep us distracted. They'll be promoting one group or one cause, which they don't care about at all. As soon as it's fulfilled their needs, they, they dump that group or that cause that they are actively promoting at one moment in time. And as soon as that distraction's over, they start another one. You know the score. You know, if you're a bit wise, you, you've, you've woken up by now how they work. I personally don't believe in these so-called democratic countries that there is a democracy. I really don't believe it. You know, they go through the motions of taking your votes uh, and then they'll go ahead and do exactly what they want anyway. And I see time and time again that the people's popular choice doesn't actually get elected. They choose some very unpopular person to be leader. You see it around the world. You see this happening time and time again. 
So I don't believe in democracy at all. They will let you think that you have the power to influence the outcome, but you don't really. You don't. When I hear of such atrocities as the Holocaust and other such atrocities around the world before and after that, it doesn't surprise me. It saddens me. It makes me despair, but it doesn't surprise me. I mean, we hold the power. We are the masses, but they quickly stamp out any uprising. They have become very expert at that. Any information is stopped. The person leading the uprising is quickly killed or jailed forever uh, or disappears. That's how they work. That is how they work. I don't have the answer. It saddens me, really, the, the state of the world. Some countries have it better than others, the living conditions of its citizens. I'm in one of the lucky countries, but still, even where I live, it's not a democracy. It's just not. I don't know the answer. I don't know what to do about it. Thinking about the Holocaust, I was thinking there's no way that that could happen today, surely. You know, as blatant as it was, we we just wouldn't stand for it. Or would we? And then I watched a documentary on the killing nurses of the Third Reich. Uh, Very interesting. And the professor at the end said they could do it a lot more subtly nowadays because in certain countries like the USA, people don't have enough health insurance and if they get seriously ill, they cannot afford to pay for their operations. And could it be in the future, he said, that euthanasia programs, like we have legally here in Switzerland, could actually be implemented and offered to people as a solution to their pain if they were terminally ill. That's scary. Although I actually am in support of euthanasia like we have in Switzerland, if it could release you from immense pain uh, where you have no chance of being healed, uh, then I'm for it, absolutely. But it could be abused, couldn't it? As a, a way to get rid of people who are, or what they might class the ruling powers, as a burden to society, costing too much. Could that happen in the future? Tell me what you think. They have, of course, total control of the internet and media. It's the nature of the beast. Will this video be buried by the time it gets to YouTube? I would probably say yes. I'd be very surprised if they don't demonetize it and and hide it, basically, shadow ban it. That's just the way it is. Uh, You know, I'm under no illusion. In the creation of this video, I I knew that was probably going to be the outcome. But you guys on Patreon got to hear what I had to say. Not that I'm any great authority on the subject. And who knows what's going to happen in 1.5 years' time. A lot can happen in that time. A lot does happen in that time. On a lighter note, and meaning no disrespect to the people who lost their lives in the bombings of Dresden, Hamburg, etc., this image here fascinated me because I love old signs and... When I look at the destruction of the building, the glass has gone, most of the brickwork, and that sign is hanging on there for dear life. That is a good sign maker. That is absolutely amazing. Even on the side there, it seems to have survived. (laughs) Just the sign above the door. I find that incredible. I find that incredible. And on another lighter note, before I head off, look what I found today rummaging through the garage. It's a self-portrait I did in charcoal back in the early 90s in my gothic days. Me standing at the portal of Hades. And yes, we're going to need some damn big candles to light the way. Well, my friends, I have ranted enough. I shall now leave you in peace. Until next time, I've no idea what the next video is going to be about. It's a surprise for me, even. I really haven't had time to think about what it is. Uh, but I'm sure it will be something interesting and a totally different topic to this. I'm going to love you and leave you. Take care. God bless. Bye-bye. Report objectionable material to the police. Every arrest and prosecution, every conviction, is a step in the education of the public to the solution of the problem. Oh, God, deliver us, Americans from evil.